House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Well, welcome back into the House of Mystery, and here we go again. Mr. David North Martino. Yes, what present. I am here. Present. What present do you have? Oh, <laughs> a present for you, Well, Yeah, great. Money. I take money. <laughs> okay. Otherwise, I'll return it and get the money. <laughs> no <Hey>. personal <laughs> checks. No personal <laughs> checks. Yeah, that's my buddy. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So listen, um, so you were just on a show. You should talk about it. Yeah. You were oh, sure. Karate, Kung Fu. Yeah, them's fighting words with our fighting. I, I can't even say it. Them's fighting words <laughs> with... Um, with uh, Dominic Izzo, and he interviewed me on uh, martial arts and my martial arts history, and yeah, it was fun. It was a good time. Yeah, kind of looked like it was. Hmm. Um, well, so now for me, I, of course, you can catch me on Prime right now. <laughs> oh, that's four, right. Four part series, Death State, yeah. Dating Death, I think that's what it's called, uh, made by Sundance, and it's on Prime, running free, so you can watch it, and if you like it, great, and if you don't, too bad. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, you look great. They they put you basically as part of the advertisement. Yeah, I'm surprised. I guess they used me a lot, but I went through the whole story with them, so I think that was why. You know, and yeah. they had all the. They did a lot of really good research. It turned out really well. It was a good, good show as far as that. They're very thorough, so you know, I'm happy with it. Um, Excellent. But I'm not watching it because I don't want to see my shiny head. <laughs> They powdered my head. That's the one they powdered my head. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. That's terrible. But, oh, well, what can you do? Okay. Now, today we are talking about another uh, a series of books that looks like it's going to be um, on Paramount Plus as a series. So that's, that'll be interesting. Yeah. So now the writer of the book, the books are called Wolf Pack. It's a four-book series. And uh, let's get him in. So we, we're talking to... Um, Ado fan, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for having me, Alan. Pleasure. You must be excited that uh, it's picked up by Paramount. I am ecstatic. It's like um, being struck by lightning and winning the lottery in the same day. Plenty of uh, books get optioned. Uh, the option and the production was um, at light speed, even warp factor, uh, between when the option was signed and when the the Premiere is going to be January 26th on Paramount Plus. Wow, that's great. I, I, yeah, because it, it doesn't always happen that fast. Quite often it can stay optioned for quite a while, a couple of years even, and, and sometimes it doesn't even happen. So. As a matter of fact, I had uh, two books optioned, you know, 18-month options, and uh, they uh, they lapsed and there was no more interest. But funnily enough, so in 2004, when the book was first published, there was two parties interested. One was an associate producer on the uh, Survivor series. So I thought, okay, he's got some juice. And then there was another person who had a development deal with Paramount Pictures. And I thought, wow, this is great. And they expressed interest and then nothing, zero, no other contact, nothing. And then 16 years later, uh, my agent gets an email saying someone's interested in the uh, television movie rights to the book and like it was hard to get excited about it at that time because we've been through this before yeah it's one of those things you know um so how did you come to 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 write this um series like how, where did it come from for you well i'd been writing uh, adult horror fantasy and all kinds of things and while i'd finally made it into mass market paperback which was my goal to read the reach the largest number of readers, um, the books kind of stalled on the shelf or actually didn't make it into bookstores, which was a whole other matter. And my wife, who was a children's librarian librarian at the time, said, you should uh, write for young adults. I took that to heart. And I did two, I edited two anthologies. One was called Be Afraid and the next one was called Be Very Afraid. I proposed a third one called Poop Your Pants, but uh, it didn't work out that way. <laughs> yeah. So I, I edited those anthologies, and uh, so I decided I was going to write my own novel, and I wanted to do something in the horror uh, genre. And I thought, okay, I'm going to write about teenagers, 
teenagers who have all the problems of being teenagers, plus they're werewolves. And um, I came up with what I thought, and I still think is one of the best scenes ever to start the series. And uh, it starts with a forest fire, which was picked up on by Jeff Davis, who created the show. And he ran with the four, forest fire motif. But my novel starts with a forest fire and a park ranger finding some uh, wolf cubs after the fire. And he takes them home and turns out they're more than just uh, wolf cubs. So that was the start of it. And my wife loves to take credit for being the one to uh, tell me to do that. So. I don't have any problem with that, though. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but was it a difficult transition to make uh, going from adult fiction, let's say writing short fiction in like the Hot Blood series, uh, which is more of a like erotic horror, to writing for young adults? Um, were there any challenges along the way? I don't think there were. I uh, I had learned with the Be Afraid series of what was possible and what wasn't in that series i wanted to include a story by joe lansdale called duck hunt where uh, the editor said no no we can't do that it's just a little too extreme and i thought okay i get it i just thought it was a terrific story and i thought very impactful but a little bit too much so it was just a question of being writing clear precise storylines and, you know, just doing the, by this time I'd been a professional writer for a while. And you resist the temptation to put blood and, and guts and gore in it. And I did that and there no sex and there's kind of a, a romance, you know, a kind of a tender romance between two teenagers, but nothing overt or anything like that. And I just think all the years of writing, professionally and, and knowing the market and having an idea. And to be honest, I wrote the kind of story that I wanted to read when I'd been a, a teenager or preteen. And that was sort of the guiding thing. And I think it worked out because it was very successful, the first book especially. And I'd like to think that it was different from what was else was out there. So I followed my gut instinct and it turned out to be the right thing the basic premise of the series what what is that so people that don't know get get a clue of what's going on here well to be honest with you i haven't seen it yet so i'm a little in the dark i've seen the trailer like everyone else and i know a little bit of what's going on uh, the world premiere is uh january 26th on paramount plus but the sneak premiere in, in los angeles is the 16th and i'll be going there and here's the premise from my books. Four teenagers who are also werewolves have been adopted by a park ranger, and he is raising them as his own children, keeping their secret away from the townspeople and trying to raise them as best he can. But they, you know, they have the call of the wild and they are living between two worlds and he's walking a tightrope trying to keep them alive and keep their secret. In the series, only two teenagers are have been adopted by the park ranger and two more are added after attack, an attack during a wildfire. And from there, I really am not sure where it's going yet because I haven't seen it, but I trust Jeff Davis. He did Teen Wolf series for uh, six, seven seasons, 100 episodes. And from what I've seen, he's got a real idea in mind and a real vision, and I'm all for that. And I'm eager to see how it turns out, just like everyone else. So can they go much further than what you've written? They're allowed to kind of take it somewhere that you haven't even written yet? They have purchased the property from me, right? So they have the yeah. right to change it in any way they seem fit. But I think at the core of it, is going to always remain um, in my books. The pack are, and the ranger is a, is a protector of the forest, a protector of nature. As a matter of fact, in my books, they never call him dad. They call him Ranger Brock or the ranger because of it. It's a, it's a uh, sign of respect. And they realize that he is a protector of the forest. So that is their attachment to him. And he's a father figure as well, but, 
I kind of hammered it home that they always call him the, the ranger. So that is going to be core. Now, to be honest, the first book has a storyline that would have made a fine one hour and a half movie. And each of the following three books would have been another episode or a, a, a film in, in itself. But this is going to be a series that hopefully is going to stretch out many seasons. There's eight episodes in the first season. If it gets picked up, who knows how many there will be in the second season. So I understand that there's a little artistic license to change characters, combine things, expand things, introduce new new things. And that's why I'm not a television uh, executive producer and a show creator. I come up with ideas for books and somebody feels those ideas are worthy of being expanded on the screen, then have at it and let's see what you can do with it. Well, I was going to ask, too, uh, you know, your experience with Hollywood, did you um, have any input into the series that they talked to you or anything like that? Or is it, you know, it, it, normally for writers, we end up, you know, not getting consulted. <laughs> I've been asked this before, and I say I had absolutely zero input, none whatsoever. Um, I was like everyone else, just getting tidbits here and there, and uh even in in the the book, I, I named the the ranger uh, Garrett Brock, and then I learned that his name had been changed to Garrett Briggs, and I'm thinking, well, he's they changed the name, but he's just as uh, rugged and handsome in both mediums. And then when I met Jeff Davis in October in Atlanta, he said, you know, we've tried really hard to keep the name, but uh, Paramount wouldn't go for it, and I. I understand that they do searches on these names. They don't want any confusion with any other character or any other property or universe or in that. In that. Um, even the four names, uh, you, you get a kick out of this. The four principal teenagers I named Noble, Argus, Tora, and Harlan. Harlan being my little joke about Harlan Ellison because he was the runt of the litter. <laughs> Harlan is the only name of the four that made it into the TV series. And he's like the biggest, strongest um, <laughs> teenager there. And the other ones are named uh, Everett, Blake, and Luna. Luna, it seems like an obvious choice, but my werewolves in the book had nothing to do with the moon. They could change at will. And uh, But I, I think in the, in the series, the, the moon has something to do with it. So we'll have to see. But, you know, all of these things, minor changes, lots of things are going to be changed. And I have no problem with that at the heart of it. It's my book. And I'm, I'm, um, I'm reminded of a story of a writer who was at a convention and a fan came up and said to him, how could you let them do that to your book? Speaking of some adaptation of a film. And the writer said, they haven't done a thing to my book. It's still up on the shelf. If you want to read it, it's there, complete. You can read it at your leisure. And that's the way I'm looking at it. I wrote the books. They did. They were as successful as they were. Now someone is taking, a, taking them and making a, their vision of it. And I'm just looking forward to the ride and enjoying it every step of the way. Uh, how, how did you write um, the four main characters as teens? Like, did you have um, any issues or problems getting into the mind of what teenagers would do nowadays? Um well, this was 2004, so social media wasn't around. No one was staring at their phone at the time. They might have had cell phones, but God forbid they were only for making phone calls. Um, what I did was remembered when I was a teenager and in school, I had basically fond memories of high school, but being aware, I know a lot of people did not. And as funny as it might seem, I spent three years as a school bus driver because uh, there was a time I was a full-time writer and I needed to supplement my income. And you might think that's strange, but school bus driver is the perfect job for an aspiring writer. You get a, an income every week. They give you a vehicle to drive. You can stop off anywhere on your way to and from your, your, your run to pick up things or do shopping, whatever. And you have a six hour block in the middle of the day to do your writing. And when you're driving, you can also think of what you're going to be writing. So it was a perfect job. And I watched very closely how mean and petty and selfish all these teenagers could be. 
toward each other and towards supposedly their friends. And just, you know, a writerly observance of that and then put it in the books. And that that was my study period. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny, I guess. Uh, um, so so you like writing this kind of book then a lot. It turned out really well for you. Well, it turned out 16 years later. I mean, if I had, if this had happened 16 years ago, I might still be writing. Who knows where I'd be right now? But um, I had spent. It's funny. I, I I made an arrangement with my wife that I would uh, try to be a full time freelance writer for five years, and it stretched out into 12. And I uh, had made it into mass market paperback and things like that, and there were some setbacks and there's a, a saying in, in writing uh, circles or any art. It's one thing for me to suffer for my art, but it's another thing for having those people around you also suffer for your art. So I decided, you know, I did a very, I, I did made a, a decent living in my last year as a full-time freelance writer, but it was to the point where, you know, it's time to get a job with the benefits and a pension and things like that. So I did. And then, you know, this comes along 16 years later and people are thinking, Oh, you're so successful. Like, uh, yeah, this turned out to be successful, but there was, you know, lean period in between. So I, that's why I'm enjoying it so much now because it's earned. You know, it just didn't happen, and I just didn't decide, oh, I'm going to write a bestseller, which, you know, sometimes people give you advice. You know what you should write? They say, you should write a bestseller. <laughs> oh, I never thought of yeah. that. But anyway, so there was hard times and lean times, and so when this came along, let's just hop on board and enjoy every moment of it. And, you know, this this show is part of it. You know, I'm having a blast these days, and I appreciate everyone's interest yeah, yeah, it's always good, you know. Hey, uh, so um, did you have to make changes in the book um, over the 16 years, like when you look at how you originally wrote it and how it is today when someone picks it up? Is there, it, Did you make any changes yourself? Well, the funny thing, and this is why when uh, an offer for the option came, the book had been out of print for 12 years. And I'm thinking, don't they know that the book's out of print? You know, they're they're making this offer, and um, no, I didn't change anything. We actually have a new issue, new edition uh, published now, and it'll be in stores when the series uh, debuts. But I was not inclined to change any of it. I mean, I did what I did. It was good enough then. It's certainly good enough now. And I'm not one for changing things. I like them to be a, a time capsule of the, the time. I mean, we could have updated it, sure, but once you start messing with it, something's going to be missing. Some Whatever magic is in that book might have been gone, so let's just leave it as it is and have everyone judge it on its merits as it is. Well, it's funny, when you when you put this together and all that, uh, where, do the, where do you get your characters from? Like when you actually have Noble and Argus and stuff, are they after people you know or kids you know or like where where do they originate? Uh, writers go through their lives observing everyone around them, and when you need something like that, you start looking back in your history and you remember people, or you imagine you'd like to have met this person, or he should have been this way, or maybe he's, you know, he has adult qualities, but he's a, a teenager. Like Noble is the leader. So he's got wisdom beyond his years. And I don't, I don't remember if I ever met a teenager like that. <laughs> Maybe I didn't go in those circles. Most of them were like stupid and immature, but for my, the purposes of my book, he needed to be the leader and he needed to be wise and smart. Argus is probably more akin to people I knew in high school, just like let's fight and let's, uh, let's beat somebody up and ask questions later and let's solve everything with violence and uh, you know it, it just you, you pick and choose and kind of make an amalgam of uh, everything that that character should be and hopefully you can pull it off and make it believable 
But what about the idea of shape shifting? Uh, did, did you draw from mythology and folk tales, or did you just let your imagination go wild and uh, create something uh, different? I did not worry too much about shape shifting. The first chapter of the book is the teenagers. Uh, I won't. It won't spoil anything because you'll have to read the whole book to see how it turns out. But the first chapter, the four of them are in the forest, are practicing their shape shifting. In my book, they can do it at will. So they're kind of extending their arms and trying to control the the shift from human to werewolf to wolf on parts of their body. Uh, and they are there is a camera crew in the forest that are doing a story on forest regeneration because it's been 16 years since the forest fire tore through that area. They're talking about how it's come back to life. And they, when they look at the tape later, they catch them in the corner in the background doing this shape shifting. So I'm not sure in folklore and in werewolf literature, if a lot of, Shape shifting is done voluntarily and be, can be controlled in that way, but that's how it is in my my books. And if that's different and new, great. Um, if not, uh, I'm sure I added something to the mix that somebody hasn't done before. But for me, the wool, the the moon, and everything had been done to death. So these guys can change when they want to. They go for runs when they like. They like being in the forest. And they're sort of bound to being human because that's how they're being raised. But it's not their favorite form. What What is your inspiration on something like this? Did you did, Were you totally into this type of a story beforehand? Is that, you know, science fiction and fantasy and all that? Or um, where does it come from for you? I'd always written, okay, well, first of all, I started writing because I loved Ray Bradbury's The October Country. Every short story in there was something magical, and I finished it, you know, finished each story and say, wow, that was terrific. That was fantastic. I read the next one. That was great. And I decided that's the kind of author I wanted to be, someone who could write short stories that people would read and go just be amazed by. It's a lofty goal, but that's what I set out to do. And I've written, say, 350 stories, and I say about 10 to 15 of them are bang on, spot on, almost perfect. And so I've succeeded in some small way. What I always wanted to write was stories that are set in the present day that just have a tiny bit of supernatural to the fantasy or science fiction element that sets it apart. Always grounded in the present day in our world world that we recognize but some little element that's different so that's why these teenagers have all the problems of regular teens going to high school you know acne and uh, shyness and all the bullying and all that plus they're werewolves so that was my my thing on it and uh, i think it's recognizable it won the silver birch award and that's voted on by school-aged children in the province of ontario and it was their favorite book of that year, and it won by a handy uh, margin. And I'm quite proud of that. So I think I succeeded. Do you, do you feel you're um, a natural short story writer? You talk about short stories and stuff. Or do you feel you're more of a natural novelist having having written a series and, and other, and other uh, uh, longer uh, works? And, and do you have a preference? I have an absolute preference. I wish I could make li a living writing short stories. If I was born in the 1940s or 30s, I might be a wealthy man in terms of being a writer or a happier man. I loved writing short stories. They were the challenge for me. And I've written a few that I think are, are good. Some are might be great, but that's not for me to decide. But I wrote novels because, you know, I, I would spend three weeks writing a story getting it right on and getting a hundred dollars for it. So obviously it had to go into the longer form. And I, one complaint is my, of my law of longer fiction is the characters aren't well-rounded or well-formed. You know, Stephen King can do that 
without even thinking about it. He can go into a tangent and, and draw a character up over 10 or 15 pages and just explaining their character. I seem to be a story oriented writer. My stories start and they go like a bullet to the end. And, you know, no one's ever wondering what the heck happened in that story. They always know and they're reading to see what happens next. So absolutely preferred, preferred to be a short story writer. I'm a novelist. I am. All my novels seem to struggle to get past 300 pages. And uh, even the Wolfpack books, they started out like 100 and close to 200 pages. And the last one was like 174. So it was just, you know, I, I struggle with the longer form. If I had continued, maybe I uh, had gotten better at it, but preferred writing short stories. It was the most fun. And, you know, when I got to the end of one and I knew I did it right, it was just so much gratification. Same with novels, but it takes a longer time to get there. And uh, if I had my choice, I'd love to make a living writing short stories, but there's, you know, practicalities. So did you did you actually uh, quit writing then? And then are you coming back to it now? Are you going to start writing new books again? You know, I get asked this question, too, a lot of times. And like, uh, yeah, I should start writing again in the hopes that I get struck by lightning again or I win the lottery a second time. Um, you know, I'm 60 years old now. And to be honest, when I was writing full time, that was my job. That was my the, the thing that consumed me 24 hours a day, everything I did was to advance my writing or to work on my writing, to promote my writing, to come up with ideas for my writing. And it was a grind for 12 years. And I think uh, Judith Merrill said, it's not fun writing. It's having fun, having written, you know, so when you're finished, that's when the fun starts. The writing is, people don't understand the amount of dedication and input and just focus it takes to write well and to write per consistently and being persistent on it. I could take it up again, but I don't think my heart would be in the same, would be the same. And I don't think I would produce as as good a quality as when I was laser focused on what I was doing. I mean, it's, I don't know if writers or aspiring writers listen to this show and it might be soul crushing to hear, but it is, you know, the hardest thing to do, sit down and just create and conjure up and make everything work and fit. And I was exhausted at the end of it. And it was like, you know, I've done this. Uh, it's time to take a, a rest. I might take it up. If someone asks me to write something for them, I would gladly take that up. But to sit in front of the computer and do something up and then think, where am I going to sell this? Where is it going to see print? You know, and all like that is just, it was a grind. And I'm glad that it was over. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I know what you mean. And it's tough putting yourself back in that place. So. So now, did you, um, when you wrote this series, did you did you have an underlying theme or subtext or some sort of thing you wanted the reader to get when they picked up one of the books? Well, the one thing is the uh, respect for the forest. Um, in the second book, a logging company tries to jump uh, their claim and get a an area that has more wood and easier access. So the pack actually works with the townspeople and kind of convinces them that they're being dishonest and they end up moving away. Um, the, in the fourth book uh, called Wolf Men, I should just say they're called uh, Wolf Pack, Lone Wolf, Cry Wolf, and Wolf Man. And in Wolf Man, a sort of wild werewolf is created when a, a a wolf is turned into a werewolf and that werewolf doesn't have any respect for human culture human mannerisms human property or anything he just decides i am one of them now i can take whatever i want i can just be like them and when 
its mate gets shot, he comes to the, the ranger and because he knew the ranger was somebody who looked after the forest and could help him. So I think that's the overarching theme is like respect for the forest and all its wild things and not to encroach and, and, uh, that's basically it. And uh, if there's something more, I'm just looking for some critic to tell me what it is. So <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'm wondering, um, how was it to work with uh, Robert Block as an editor? Because I know uh, you were in an anthology where he was uh, the editor in that anthology. And uh, I, I don't know if you got any mentoring or anything like that. I, I know that he did mentor some people in the horror community. So I'm just, just interested in, in your experience. He did. It's an interesting uh, question because Robert Block's Psychos was put together after he passed away with the cooperation of his estate. So as much as my story, um, I, I love Robert Block. He's one of my favorites. Robert Block, Ray Bradbury, Richard Matheson, Joe Lansdale, Robert Block's one of my favorites, and I love the, the twist that he put with humor and horror together. And my story, The Rug, which was in Robert Block's Psychos, has that element to it. It has an ending that he would have enjoyed, and I just wish he had lived long enough to read my story, because I really did an homage to what he uh, did. And the book, that story ended up being a Bram Stoker Award finalist for short story. But... um I did meet him at a convention in London, and he was hilarious. He was very gracious and accommodating. He uh, was very respectful of everybody. I did an article, actually, about him for the London Free Press. I pitched a freelance article, and he complimented me by saying there was nothing incorrect in the story. <laughs> so I don't know if he enjoyed it, appreciated the story, or is just being, you know, uh, petty or you know, uh, sort of an open-handed, uh, backhanded compliment, but uh, he was a very uh, funny man, and I appreciated the time I spent with him. As far as mentoring, I'll just put this in. A story I wrote with uh, co-writer David Nickel won the Bram Stoker Award, and the story is called Rat Food. And we had originally submitted it to an anthology series called Masks, edited by Jerry Williamson, J.N. Williamson. And he didn't end up publishing the story, but he gave us about three pages of notes on how we could improve it. And we did utilize just about everything that he suggested, and it ended up winning the Bram Stoker Award. So as far as mentoring goes and authors who can pay it forward, uh, he was one of them, and I appreciate that very much. And I'm often trying to do the same because I respect what they did for me and my collaborator, and I want to do that for other people as well. Yeah, Jay and Williamson was was a big uh, mentor was in the community as well. I was reading a lot of his books back in the 80s. <laughs> I read a uh, – I don't think it's a bad thing to say, and I don't think people who had read his books would uh, quibble with it. I read a lot of his novels back in the day, and – to this day, if you ask me what any of them were about, I cannot tell you. <laughs> but I enjoy them uh, when I read them, but I don't recall any of them. <laughs> well, so now, are you are you set up now for interaction with with fans or readers or anything like that? Are you you got social media that that you know you can have people follow you, or do you have a website or anything like that? What do you what are you set up now? I did for a while have a website and. Uh, because I wasn't writing, I let that fall by the wayside. I use uh, my agent's uh, website. He's got an author page, Jabberwocky Literary Agency. If you go to that website, look up authors and then my name, you'll see a representation of all my titles. But, you know, I've been on Facebook for years, and that's your grandfather's social media, and I got that all figured out. But once this happened, <clears throat> I had to learn Instagram and Twitter, and I'm – learning TikToks uh, slowly and I don't really know how it works and I uh, you know you can watch me staring at my phone saying I just saw it there where did it go I can't find it anymore so I'm learning and I'm hoping to do a TikTok uh, series when the series comes out called Wolfpack Facts to do like 30 second or a minute videos where I can talk about the book and the series and how they go together and what 
different and things like that. So I'm embracing social media and I'm interacting with as many fans as I can. And like I said before, I am just having a blast. I am enjoying every moment of this and I'm going to savor every moment because once it's over, who knows when it'll come back and I am just enjoying it. And if I can interact with people who are enjoying either the series or the books, I'm going to do that. I'm figuring that out. Yeah. That's, well, you might as well enjoy it while you, while you have it because that's how it goes. You never know. But uh, fantastic. Now, we're going to have that up on our website, too, so people can find you easily through our website, one click. So I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you having me. We've been talking about the, uh, the Wolfpack series, and uh, it's going to be coming up on Paramount Plus, and we'll have all that up on the website. So, uh, Edo, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Alan. Thanks, Edo. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.